The new year is often a time of reflection, a chance to look back on the past 365 days and remember. Sometimes the memories bring a smile, and other times they break our hearts. Chances are you've experienced a bit of both this past year. The new year is also a time to look ahead, to imagine what could be, to scan the horizon with expectation and seek God's guiding hand. It's a time to strive for better, to live louder, love stronger, and be more of who God has created us to be. It's an opportunity for new beginnings, a chance to start fresh, to pursue God with a renewed passion, and to press on with all our hearts. The truth is, God has been faithful this past year, and that faithfulness promises to carry us through the next. As the new year begins, may we remember this one simple truth. In Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. Well, when we look around today, I guess we ask the question, did we miss the rapture? And the answer is no, right? Because we're the faithful remnant here today. Thank you for gathering uh, with us. Many of you are also engaging online. I'm going to invite you to stand and for our call to worship, uh, listen to Psalm 95. I'm pausing because we all just rushed in. Let's get our mind focused now as we hear these words from God's living and active word. Oh, come. It's an invitation. Let us worship and bow down. Just go ahead and just bow your head now as I continue to read. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God. And we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today means right now. If you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. Lord, we don't want to be a people who harden our hearts even when we see you at work. Lord, you have gathered us here today and our hearts are bowed now before you. Lord, we acknowledge your right to reign and rule supreme over the nations, over our very lives. Lord, may you be pleased now as we offer our worship to you and we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Hey, you can have a seat. Well, thanks for gathering uh, here in this space or online. I want to give special thanks to our snow removal servants, uh, particular Scott Shattuck and his team. <clears throat> Early this morning, I noticed in my news feed that there are a lot of churches not meeting today. And I don't know why I did this, but I counted them. There are at least 50 churches in the Quad Cities area not meeting today, but thanks to our servants, we are gathered. I wanted to pass along some information. Three Christ followers, three members of Edgewood have been transferred to glory just this past week. George Beating, Amy Jo Miller, and Barb Acoff. Would you join me now as we pray? 
God, there are many who are grieving in our own church family, here in this community, in our state, in our country, and across the globe today. Lord, we thank you that you are close to the brokenhearted and you're attentive to their cry. Lord, there are many who are dealing with illness, Lord, we pray for your healing, pray for your protection. And Lord, as we're praying for those who are hurting, we think of those who have been ravaged by addiction, those who are caught in a web of sin. Lord, for those who are going through depression, anxiety, other mental health issues, we pray for your perfect peace since you are the Prince of Peace. Lord, we think of those dear families who suddenly in just a moment, thousands who lost their homes in Colorado. And Lord, in our community and around the world, we want to pray especially for first responders, for those part of our police and fire departments, for healthcare workers in our community. Uh, we commit them all to you. And Lord, now we give you these moments uh, for your glory and your honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I just, uh, some of you are going, man, where, where are the instruments up here today? Well, I so want to just say thanks to Pastor Chad and all that he does here at Edgewood and in our community and the worship team and our tech team. Uh, we've had some sickness on those teams and want to give a special thanks to uh, Dave Bennett serving in the back, keeping everything Going. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to worship through proclaiming God's word. We're going to pray God's word and we're going to preach God's word all without singing. You know, a lot of people say no to snow. <laughs> but do you know that the Bible says knowing about snow can actually help you grow? Uh, listen to Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as what? As snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. That word reason was used in a court of law to convince someone of what is right. And so God is saying to his people, come now, it's an invitation. Let us reason together, says the Lord. What God is saying is, I'm right and I'm righteous. You do know, don't you, that God is right and he has the right to always be right. Because he is righteous. And so right at the top, let's agree with God about the enormous gravity of the guilt of our sins. And let's also accept his legal proclamation of forgiven and no condemnation, regardless of whether or not we feel forgiven. That word scarlet is bright red. That's what our sins are like. It means they're easily seen. In the Hebrew, it's double dyed so that there's this deep, fixed permanency of sin in the heart. It's the kind of color, because it was double dyed, you could never change that color. It's the idea of having a fast or fixed color. Albert Barnes says, neither dew, rain, nor washing, nor long usage would remove it. Hence, it is used to represent the fixedness and permanency of sin in the heart. No human means will wash them out. No effort of man, no external rites, no mere tears can wash away. No sacrifice, no prayers are of themselves sufficient to take them away. And almighty power is needful to remove them. Listen again. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. It's the idea of being spotless and pure, like our sins are canceled out. And then he continues, though they are red like crimson, 
they shall become like wool. The stench of my sins has become sweet and soft. Wool is used for clothing. So our sins are canceled and they're covered. My sin, your sin, is like a blood-colored stain in our souls. Listen now to 1 John chapter 1. As we worship by hearing God's word. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son. This is good news, church. Cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. So he does more than forgive. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Something that hit me yesterday. Jesus took our sin upon himself. And right before that, they stripped him of his scarlet robe. Here's what I wrote down. His scarlet blood was shed for us so that our sins can be cleansed and covered. I invite you to close your eyes now. And take some time to confess sin. Not to rationalize it, not to blame it, not to justify it, not to say, well, I deserve this. No, just own it. Agree with God about that sin, and maybe it's a sin of the mind, sin you've committed through words, behavior, actions. Own it. Confess it, and then repent of it, turn from it. God, we thank you today for forgiveness that we don't deserve. If we got what we deserve, we'd be in big, big trouble. So thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for cleansing us, for purifying us from all of our sins through the shed blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here's what I want us to get today during this time. As important as singing is, the book of Psalms is filled with singing as part of our worship. Here's what I want you to get. In the Bible, worship is also defined as surrender, not just singing. Romans 12, verse 1, we read these words, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, here it is, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. You read through the book of Romans, the first 
11 chapters deal with doctrinal truths that are incredible. At the end of chapter 11, the Apostle Paul breaks out into doxology. Oh, he writes, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Very next verse. I appeal to you therefore, brothers. So after spending so much time discussing doctrine, he's overcome by the depth of doxology. And here the apostle Paul says, I urge you, brothers. He's making an appeal. He's not commanding them. He's saying, I urge you. He calls them brothers, which means we're from the same womb. We've all been born again. And then he says this, in view of God's mercy, That original word for mercy is plural. See, the precondition to worship is mercy. And God has demonstrated so much mercy to us, we can't help but respond by surrendering our lives to him. Isaac Watts wrote, when I survey the wondrous cross, check out this line, love so amazing, so divine, demands my, what? My soul, my life, my all. And so we're urged in view of the many mercies of God to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Now that's a concept. Old Testament sacrifices, the animals were dead. Once you offer a sacrifice to God, you can't take it back. Here, Paul's saying, present your bodies to the Lord, not bits and pieces, but all of yourself to the Lord as living sacrifices. I like what D.L. Moody observed. The problem with a living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off the altar. Yeah. <laughs> Paul continues by saying our life Offering is to be holy and pleasing to God. Brothers and sisters, the question is not every weekend, did I like the music? Did the service please me? No, the real question is this. Is my worship defined here, Romans 12, 1, as full surrender? Is my worship, the way I'm living, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God? Friends, Christianity is not a spectator sport. Worship is never meant to be something we just watch, applauding it when we like it, secretly inside, getting frustrated when we don't. One pastor says this, most of my life I thought you went to church to worship, but now I see that the better approach is to go worshiping to church. And while our time together for corporate worship on weekends is extremely important, God is concerned with how our service of worship goes, our spiritual act of worship. So I'm going to make a call to you. It's an appeal because you're my brother and my sister. Here's the appeal. Will you right now surrender yourself fully to the Lord? Right here, right now. Not later, not tomorrow, right now. Close your eyes, do some business with the Lord. If there's anything you've been holding back, any part of your life, if you know you've just been living for yourself, make this your spiritual act of worship. Surrender everything, all to Jesus right now.
Let's continue now in worship by listening to God's word. Isaiah 66, 2, all these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. And then he says this, but this is the one to whom I will look. Interesting, God says, I've made everything, but there's somebody that gets my attention. Somebody, God says, that I look to, I look at. Well, that should get our attention, right? Like, who is God looking at? Who gets God's attention? You ready for it? Here it is. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. That's who God looks at. And so I want us to tremble at his word right now. And I don't know how it's going to work for you. Now, I'm not asking for an emotional response. But, but would you allow God's word and the depth of it to grip your soul right now? Listen to Revelation chapter 1. Verses five through eight. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, He is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God is and who was and who is to come the almighty i john your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in jesus was on the island called patmos on account of the word of god and the testimony of jesus i was in the spirit on the lord's day and i heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet what was that like And then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe. Listen to how he describes Jesus. And with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white. Get this, think of Isaiah. Like white wool, like snow his eyes his eyes were like a flame of fire his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace and his voice was like the roar of many waters in his right hand he held seven stars from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in full strength And then we're told what happened. John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. We continue hearing God's word. I'm going to ask Rocky uh, Jones to come up. Rocky's one of our uh, deacons, and Rocky's going to read from Lamentations chapter 3. He has made my teeth grind on gravel, 
and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it, and it is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Isaiah chapter 55, we read these words. It's another call, another call from the Lord. Come. It's an invitation. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Interesting, it doesn't take any money because it's free. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. One of the prayers we should be praying is asking God to revive his church. Psalm 85, 6 says, you, Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Most of you can't see it, but sitting down here in the front are some young adults, some in high school, some uh, 20-somethings, and they just returned from a conference called the Cross Conference, where they focused on the cross of Christ and the love of Jesus for the nations. And you guys must be tired and filled up with what God has taught you this week, and we pray that God will help you take your next step of obedience I want to lead us now in prayer for the nations and for our young people who are responding to the call of God on their lives. Would you join me? God, it's humbling, astonishing even, when so many on New Year's Eve are thinking about getting wasted and partying when this group down here at the front took time and money to go and to hear your call to make disciples of all nations. And Lord, there's some of them who've already taken steps and are seeking you for financial support and prayer support. And Lord, others are in conversation with sending agencies and others, perhaps for the first time, are considering what you would have for their lives. Lord, we commit all of them to you as a group and individually as well. Lord, reproduce them for your glory and for your honor. Lord, as we think of our world today, so much lostness, so much despair, so much pain, we think of missionaries strategically placed around the globe today. Lord, use them. Give them courage. Give them opportunities. Lord, may your word go forth strongly. We think of those who are being persecuted, those who are gathering today in places where they well, where they're careful and wise because it's illegal even to worship you. 
Lord, may they remain faithful. May they draw their sustenance from you. May you use them and your gospel. Lord, our world's in a bad place today. So we pray that the life-changing, life-altering gospel of Jesus Christ would penetrate lives and hearts, countries and communities, all for your glory and your honor. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. amen. You know, in this new year, you do know, right, that nothing changes in our lives just because the calendar changes? And what does Happy New Year mean anyway? Here's, here's what I think in this new year, there's gonna be some new hopes, for sure. There'll also be new obligations, new opportunities, new heartaches, new pain, new burdens, new fears. <laughs> but the same Jesus, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Some of you, when you look back on 2021, you're filled with regret, you're filled with disappointment, and some of us are nervous about 2022. They allow these words to resonate in your soul. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold. I am doing a new thing, God says. Does it not spring forth? Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Friends, life is too short to do everything we want to do. But it's long for us. It's long enough for us to do everything God wants us to do. Let's look now at the Word of God as we focus on how you and I can go into this new year without wasting this year. Several years ago, a man in Janesville, Wisconsin, I grew up near there, purchased ad space on a billboard and he put up these words, enjoy life now, there is no afterlife. Well, after that sign came down, two area churches got together. I love it when churches get together. And they put up their own message on that same billboard. Here's what it said. Life is short. Eternity is not. Friends, life is short, isn't it? One guy captured the sentiment this way. New Year's again? It seems like it was just New Year's last year. <laughs> Hey, on this second day of the new year, how many of you have already broken your resolutions? And maybe you don't want to raise your hand, and well, maybe it's because you're like, I don't even make resolutions. I break them anyway, why do it, right? You see, some of us are so skeptical of change even happening, maybe we've tried to change many times before. This is captured by the meme which says, this is my face when someone says, new year, new me. <laughs> it's like, yeah, right. Now, I understand the cynicism. I understand the skepticism all too well. But here's the downside. We can then end up not making any decisions to move forward spiritually. Donald Whitney was right when he said this, no one coasts into Christ-likeness. It doesn't just happen. I've said this before, I'll say it again, spiritual growth is intentional. It's not automatic. It doesn't just happen. So my guess is you'd like some things to change in 2022. I came across a very helpful post this week. Here's what it's called. Don't just make a resolution, make a habit. It's written by Joe Carter. Here's part of what he writes. Making a New Year's resolution is one of my favorite end-of-year activities. Every year I'm encouraged by the idea that in a mere 12 months I will have become a marginally better person. But every year I'm unable to keep the resolve in my resolutions. This year I'm trying something different. 
Instead of just making new resolutions, I intend to make new habits. A habit is a recurrent, often unconscious pattern of behavior acquired through frequent repetition. Habits drive our behavior, which in turn forms our character. And then he writes this, so true. No one wakes up one day to find they've suddenly developed either an immoral or a godly character. It is through habits of rebelliousness against God that we become slaves to sin and through habits of obedience that we become slaves to righteousness. We'll circle back to this idea at the end of the message. So instead of focusing on making resolutions, which are often futile because we try to accomplish them in our own flesh, let's allow God's holy word to shine the spotlight on four holy habits the Holy Spirit can help us cultivate this year. Open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. In the first three chapters of the book, Paul focuses on doctrine, and now he talks about duty. He starts with our position in Christ. We've been seated in the heavenly places with Christ. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And then he talks about how to live that out. Would you stand as we read? Let's read together Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 18. Ephesians 5, let's read together. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. You can have a seat. God, help us now to understand and then to apply your word by your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Here's our outline. It's pretty simple. Live wisely, leverage your time, learn God's will, and lean into the Holy Spirit. Here's a summary of where we're headed. Since our time here on earth is limited, let's make the most of the time we have left. Well, let's dive in. Number one, live wisely. I'm in verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. I can't even count the number of times my mom would say to me growing up, be careful, watch out. And I'm sure our daughters would say the same thing about our parenting. We were always telling them to be careful, to be aware of their surroundings. The Apostle Paul is saying, be careful, be skillful, be on guard. Make sure you look around so you don't stumble. The word has the idea of exactness, precision, accuracy. One Greek scholar says it like this, be constantly taking heed, therefore, how accurately you are conducting yourselves. Oh, and it's a present imperative, meaning it's a command to continually pay attention to how we're living. We're to be constantly careful. That same word is used in Hebrews 3.12, writing to believers, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. It's probably fair to say, too many of us, myself at times included, are spiritual sluggards. We're just living kind of sloppy spiritual lives. And instead of fighting sin, some of us take exit ramps all the time. Someone has said the tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon, but that we wait so long to begin it. Check out what D.A. Carson writes, people do not drift toward holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate toward godliness, prayer, obedience to Scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. We drift toward compromise, and we call it tolerance. We drift toward disobedience. We call it freedom. We drift toward superstition. We call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control and call it relaxation. We slouch toward prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we have escaped legalism. 
we slide toward godlessness and convince ourselves we've been liberated. Friends, are you living wisely? Secondly, leverage your time. I'm in verse 16, making the best use of the time. Why? Because the days are evil. It's also translated as redeem the time. There are two different Greek words for time. One is chronos, that's quantitative time. It refers to the passing of, well, of minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and decades and centuries. It, it's how we measure time. But sadly, most people are just going through the motions, wasting time or passing time. Some are like passengers on a plane who heard the pilot give this message. We've lost our position, folks. We've been flying rather aimlessly for over an hour. That's the bad news. The good news is we're making very good time. <laughs> Well, that's chronos time. There's another time. It's called kairos. That's qualitative time. It's the idea of an opportune moment, also translated as the appointed time, a fixed or special occasion. It's a period of opportunity which is open for a while and then closes. It's not clock time. It's kingdom time. Colossians 4, 5 says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Question, are you ready to move from living a Kronos life where you're just kind of stumbling through it to moving to a Kairos life so you'll focus on each moment as a supreme moment? William Penn once said, time is what we want the most, but what we use the most the worst. I don't speak much Latin. Okay, not any. <laughs> but I've always liked the phrase carpe diem. I always feel smart when I say it. I think it means seize the day, right? Yeah, that's pretty good advice. But it's actually more helpful to say carpe momento. Seize the moment. Some time ago, I don't even know why I did this, I checked out some countdown clocks on the web. I'm not sure that was a good idea. So here's how it works. You enter your age and other factors, and this website will tell you how much time you have to live. <laughs> One site I visited had this description. The Internet's friendly reminder that life is slipping away second by second. <laughs> when I first checked this out a couple years ago, I was told I was going to die on October 17th, 2033. But I filled out the information again. It's a true story. I found out my life has been extended. <laughs> well, now I'm going to live till April 19th, 2048. I don't know how I've been given an additional 15 years. <laughs> but like Hezekiah, I'll take it but I hope I do a better job than he did with his extra time. Some of you are like, who's Hezekiah? <laughs> Second Kings 20. So another website, you guys are probably like, why are you doing this? I don't know. <laughs> so I went to another website. It asked for a ton of additional input, including whether I floss my teeth. I do. And how much butter I use. Not a lot, although I'm glad it didn't ask about my cheese consumption. <laughs> this site had me living an additional 13,098 days. Now, obviously only God knows the number of days we have left. But are you aware each of us should be living with an acute sense of countdown? I just want to, I got to just share some news with you. You're dying. And so am I. We're all on a countdown clock. You think, well, that's morbid. I didn't come to church in the new year to hear that. <laughs> uh, actually, it's wise to know that. You say, where do you get that? Psalm 90, verse 12. 
So teach us to number our days, comma, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Wisdom. To number means to weigh, to measure our moments so that we live them for God's glory and for the good of others, for the fame of his name among our neighbors and the nations. Psalm 39 challenges us to redeem the time. O oh Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you've made my days a few hand breaths. I think this is a hand breath. And my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Once Billy Graham was asked a question. He said, Billy, what have you been most surprised by in life? Well, with Billy Graham's history and the fruit in his life, the answer to that question should get our attention. So Billy Graham, what are you most surprised by in life? Two-word answer. It's brevity. You know, God has been teaching me four things lately about life. Number one, life is fast. It's here and then it's gone. Secondly, life is fragile. It's so fragile. Number three, Life is futile apart from Christ. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. And the fourth thing he's been teaching me is life here is final. Once our life here is over, our life here is over. The missionary Adoniram Judson once said these words, a life once spent is irrevocable. It will remain to be contemplated through eternity. The same may be said of each day. When it is once passed, it is gone forever. Friends, not, let's not just mark time. Let's use the time we have left to make a mark for the kingdom. Let's not just waste time. Let's worship God with our time. You know, we live in a world filled with evil influences and evil individuals, and it's easy here to think Paul is saying, hey, be active because the days are short. He doesn't say that. He tells us to take advantage of the opportunities. Why? Because the days are evil. I mean, doesn't it seem as if evil has been unleashed in our world? What was considered right is now wrong, and what was wrong is now considered right, and suddenly everybody has a right to be wrong. I was reflecting on this a couple months ago, and I've shared this before, but I like to come back to it. What used to be considered an abomination which led to lamentation has become a celebration demanding participation because the unthinkable has now become unquestionable. Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Listen, in the midst of great evil, we should lament, and there's plenty to lament. But never forget, there's always great opportunity. Every occasion is a time to grab the good and shun the sin. 1 Thessalonians 5, but test everything. Hold fast, church, what is good. 
abstain from every form of evil. Every time you can do something good, you should. Have you ever used the phrase, I'm just killing time? I have. I, I wonder if you'd join me in something. Let's never say that again. Let's never say, I'm just killing time. No, by God's grace. Let's fill our time. You see, wasting the gift of time insults the giver of time. Most time is wasted not in hours, but in minutes and seconds. As someone has said, the only piece of eternity we'll ever hold in our hand is the opportunity at hand right now. We have no other time in which to live. This is our time. Perhaps you've heard this uh, saying, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a what? Mystery. Mystery. Today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. Some of you like to study and read and go deep. Uh, Aaron, I see you down here uh, with uh, one of the books that I highly recommend is called Don't Waste Your Life by John Piper. And some of you would do really well to read this book. Let me just read you a quote from the book and you may go, I need to pick that up. Here's what he writes. Whatever you do, find the God-centered, Christ-exalting, Bible-saturated passion of your life and find your way to say it and live for it and die for it. And you will make a difference that lasts. You will not waste your life. You know, maybe we should do what the 16th century reformer Philip Melanchthon did. He kept a record of every wasted moment during his day and he took his list to God in confession before he went to bed at night. I don't know what it is, but God has created opportunities for you in 2022. Well, there'll be obstacles, there'll be distractions, disappointment, because the days are evil. Ephesians 2.10 declares, however, that you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do his work in the world. Well, listen to the verse, for we are his workmanship, that means masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works. This is, I love this next part, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, which means God has works for you and I to do. He's already prepared them. Our job is to walk in them. He has work prepared for you this year. Will you do what he has for you to do? Since our time on earth is limited, let's make the most of the time we have left. Live wisely. Leverage your time. That leads to the third holy habit. Learn God's will. Ephesians 5.17 clarifies what is important. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In Proverbs, the fool is one who doesn't follow God's ways. He might know, he or she might know the right thing to do, but instead does the opposite or (laughs) simply does nothing. Proverbs 132 says the complacency of fools will destroy him. You know, many times we talk about the will of the Lord. God, what's your will for my life? God loves when we ask that question in prayer to him. But here's something I've been thinking about related to that. God is primarily focused on our transformation than on our location. We tend to lock into where God wants us and what God wants us to do. Those are important, no doubt, while God is all about who we're becoming. 
The word understand carries the idea of assembling facts into an organized whole, like putting pieces together in a puzzle. God doesn't always tell us everything about the future, but here's a helpful principle. If you want to know God's will, then do the will of God you already know. Some of us think, well, God's will is so mysterious. God, what do you want me to do? And many times, I think God answers that question this way. I've already told you in my word. And you're not doing what I've already said to do. That old adage is true, God doesn't steer parked cars. We've learned this principle through our study of the book of Acts, Paul's missionary journeys. If you want the Almighty to guide you, start moving, start serving, start doing those things you already know he wants you to do. I wrote down eight ways God's word is clear about God's will. Here they are. Number one, it's God's will for you to be saved. Number two, it's God's will. We just studied that. It's actually Romans 12, 1. God wants you to surrender. Number three, God wants you to be sanctified and to avoid immorality. Listen, if you're unmarried and you're living in sexual immorality, you're out of God's will. You're like, oh, that's strong. No, that's what the Bible says. Or if you're married and you're cheating on your spouse, you are outside of God's will. It's very clear, 1 Thessalonians 4. And this is God's will, your sanctification, comma, that you avoid sexual immorality. Number four, God wants you to give thanks. That's the next chapter, 1 Thessalonians 5. Number five, God wants you to live a good life. Number six, God, what do you want me to do? God says, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. God wants us to delight in doing his will. And the eighth one I wrote down, God wants you to be a devoted disciple who makes other disciples among your neighbors and among the nations. Someone said this, life is too short to do everything we want to do, but it's long enough for us to do everything God wants us to do. Live wisely. Leverage your time. Learn God's will. Well, there's a fourth habit that it really is the most important. Lean into the Holy Spirit. If you try to make changes in your own life, if you try to live the Christian life in your own strength, in your own flesh, you're going to fail. Verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. At its core, this verse is speaking about control. Question, who or what is running your life? Is it you? Is it someone else? Is it an outside influence? Or is it the Holy Spirit? In the culture back then, many believed the spirit world could be entered through drunkenness. So if you wanted to contact the spirits or a dead ancestor, all you had to do was get drunk. The Greeks even had a god, small g, a god of wine called Dionysus. They believed when you got drunk, that god came and inspired you to do and say certain things. In light of that, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. Alcohol is sometimes referred to as spirits. Interestingly, the word debauchery has the idea of wasteful and excessive squandering. The way of the world is wasteful, isn't it? So listen, that's how Paul starts. He said, don't be controlled like that. You see the word but? It shows a contrast, an antithesis. Instead of squandering your life, being controlled by alcohol, surrender your life and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, this is a command, by the way. It's not a suggestion. Oh, and and it's also in the present tense. Meaning, we're to be filled constantly 
or more literally, keep on being filled always. So if you're saved, you receive the Holy Spirit at conversion. And so the question is not, how can I get more of the Holy Spirit? No, here's the question. How can the Holy Spirit get more of me? As the Holy Spirit fills you with his fuel, he'll give you fruit and he'll help you lead a fulfilled life. Friends, since our time on earth is limited, let's make the most of the time we have left. And we can do that by living wisely, by leveraging our time, by learning God's will and leaning into the Holy Spirit. Now, it's important when we hear preaching to put it into practice. Otherwise, it just becomes information that doesn't lead to transformation. I want to give you just one application today. You're like, I can't ever remember that I just gave one application. But let me tell you why. I think it's the most important. Because the others come out of it. Here it is. Read your Bible every day. Simply put, if you're not reading God's word, you won't know God's will and you won't grow in wisdom and you won't witness for him. So let's circle back to the importance of establishing holy habits, not making resolutions. Most of us would agree that reading the Bible is important, but many of us struggle to do so. So for this to become a daily discipline, a habit, if you will, it's important to establish a routine. I wrote down five things that have helped me. Number one, find a Bible and set it out. Just open it up and put it somewhere in your house, your apartment, your dorm room. Number two, use a Bible reading plan. We make these available every month. This month, today I read Psalm 18, tomorrow Psalm 33, it's all here. They're available at our resource kiosks. They're also on our app and on our website. Number three, determine what time you're going to read. Number four, Sit in one place. And number five, pray for insight and application. (laughs) So down in our basement, I have my ESV study Bible out on a table. Next to it is the Edgewood Bible reading plan and some daily prayer requests that I've typed out for each of our grandchildren. This is where I always sit. This is where, by God's grace, I soak up the scriptures. Uh, Some of you are stumbling because you see my cup of coffee on a Packers coaster, but (laughs) it kind of comes with it. Someone said there are two great enemies of time. Anxiety about the future and regrets about the past. That describe any of you? I wonder if some of you have been so gutted by guilt that you're on the sidelines. You think you've been DQ'd. You think you're out. Christ came to give you a fresh start through the forgiveness of your sins. I like how Tony Evans says it. Regardless of what happened yesterday, if you stick with the Lord today, your yesterday doesn't have to control your tomorrow. Regret for wasted time is more (laughs) wasted time. And the way to overcome anxiety about the future and regrets about the past is to focus on your forgiveness today. Friends, since our time on earth is limited, let's make the most of the time we have left. Many years ago, I saw an illustration, and I've always wanted to use this illustration. Perhaps some of you have seen it, but I I never had the right opportunity to use it and some of you have seen it, maybe you just saw it recently, but it's, it's so effective. So imagine this rope is a timeline, and it's a timeline of eternity. And I have it tied over there, but imagine there's no end, or no beginning, and, and there's no end here. So if that's eternity, By the way, I first heard this from Francis Chan. This section here is your life. And some of us are all up in this and we're given no thought to eternity. 
And some of us are like, well, if I just make more money here, then I can play here. Uh, this section right here is retirement. And some of us, I, we don't even think about eternity. It's like, what? What's that? I just, this is all I'm living for. We work so hard to enjoy this little sliver of time. Well, that's some of us. You know, others of us, we're wasting this. We're not even all in on this. We're just killing time, wasting time, living for ourselves. Listen, what you do here determines your eternity. Actually, let me be a little more careful in how I say that. What you believe here determines your destiny. If you believe that Jesus Christ died in your place on the cross, paying the price for all of your sins, and he was raised again on the third day, and you have repented and received him as your savior, and by his grace, you're following him as your Lord. You will spend eternity with him. Listen, we get one chance on life. And then comes eternity. The question, what are you doing with the only life you've been given? How will this year, wherever that is on this timeline, how will this year mark your life? Well, let me bring it closer to home. How will today? Well, let me bring it even closer to home. How will right now, mark the rest of your life and the rest of eternity. Hebrews 9.27 says, at the end of this short life, we're all gonna stand before God. You can't avoid that. And it says, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that to come judgment. And all that will matter is whether we have believed in and received Jesus Christ. Perhaps some of you who are engaging online have never been saved. You've never asked Jesus to apply what he did on the cross to your own life. But you're like, man, I, I don't want to waste another moment of my life without getting that settled. I'm going to ask you to bow your head, close your eyes, and you could pray along with me. Lord Jesus, I confess that I've been wasting my life just been living for myself or living with anger or bitterness or living for pleasure doesn't satisfy. Just been going through the motions. I just want to own, I want to own how I've been living and agree with you and call it sin. And so I not only admit I'm a sinner, I confess that. I cannot save myself. And I repent of my sins. I change my mind about the way I've been living. Jesus, thank you for dying in my place as my substitute on the cross. Thank you that you are the full and final sacrifice for all of my sins. And thank you that you rose again on the third day, showing how you have conquered death and the devil and all of my sins. I believe that you are the Son of God. And now I receive you, Jesus. Come into my life. Save me. I want to be born again. Convert me. Transfer me from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of your beloved Son. And I surrender to your lordship, your leadership in my life. Make me into the person you want me to be as your disciple who looks for ways to make more disciples among people I'm around and in other places I 
haven't even gone yet. Help me to live wisely, to leverage my time, to learn your will, and to lean into your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Man, if you prayed that and meant it from your heart, welcome to the family of God. We'll do all we can to help you get started as a follower of Jesus.